Welcome everyone. Today's webinar is about uh, preprinting your research and learning how to uh, do that and the current role of preprints in research communication. Uh, my name is Jim Kennar. I'm a research chemist in the Agricultural Research Service branch of the USDA. I currently work at uh, the National Center for Agricultural Utilization Research in Peoria, Illinois, and I'm serving as the editor in chief of the Journal of the American Oil Chemist Society. And today, uh, I'd just like to thank you for joining us. And our presenter today is going to be Alberto, Dr. Alberto Pepe. Um, Alberto is Senior Director of Product Strategy and Innovation at uh, Wiley, which he joined in 2018 via an acquisition of Athoria. Alberto holds degrees in astrophysics, information systems, and computer science from Harvard University, UCLA, and the University of College London. Uh, prior to starting his PhD, Alberto worked in information technology department of CERN in Geneva, Switzerland, and there he developed digital library tools and promoted open access and reproducible research among particle physicists. In 2013, Alberto co-founded Authoria, which is a collaborative publishing platform for open research. And in his current role, Alberto focuses on strategy and innovation around open research publishing. So with that, um, if you have any questions during this, the webinar, just please write your questions in the question section of the control panel, and we'll try to address all your questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Um, thanks again for joining us. And with that, I will turn it over to Alberto. Thank you so much, Jim. So uh, today's uh, presentation is really, uh, the title is a question, should you be preprinting your research? And uh, I'll try to make the case that the answer to that question is yes. Um, so I um, uh, thank you so much, Jim, for introducing me already. I have a slide here that uh, pretty much summarizes some of the uh, steps in my academic and research uh, career that you already uh, mentioned. But just to um, spend you know, a few more seconds on my background, I think what's important to say is that my background is at the intersection of, of uh, physics and computer science. And as a, as a researcher, I was in research for about 10, 12 years, I really worked at the um, I, most of my work was uh, within data science, so I was really uh, managing, handling uh, data, whether I was working in astrophysics or computer science or information science. Uh, and so as a researcher, I really got to experience firsthand some of the um, issues that, um, that researchers, uh, like some of you uh, that are attending the webinar today, experience when handling and dealing with uh, uh, data and sharing the data and openly uh, publishing uh, the data that is at the foundation of the of, of research articles. Um, what's also important is that very early on in my career, I was not only just interested in data analysis and data sharing, but I was also uh, sharing my research as early as possible. So the highlight I want to make here uh, is that I posted my first preprint in 2006. So uh, about 15 years ago uh, in the preprint server archive. So I've been interested in reproducible research, open access, open science, and uh, preprints uh, for quite a long time. And uh, since then, I've been trying to uh, develop tools and initiatives to uh, make research more, uh, more open and transparent, and in general, to really improve the way that we uh, communicate uh, and publish uh, research. As Jim mentioned, I was in research for a number of years. I then uh, uh, started a company called Authoria, and I'll be uh, talking a little bit about what we're doing with Authoria uh, today. Authoria started off as a collaborative uh, online editing tool, uh, some sort of Google Docs for research, you can think of it that way. But it's now shifting and pivoting towards a more, um, uh, more of a place to share and disseminate early uh, research as early as possible. And I've now been with Wiley for uh, two and a half years. I work with uh, Adipon, which is the, um, the uh, technical and platform uh, side of Wiley, where we, uh, once again, develop um, technologies and products to make, uh, to communicate research uh, more openly and more transparently. 
So I'll start off by just giving a definition, just in case there's someone uh, within the attendees who's not familiar with the idea of a preprint. Um, so preprint is anything I would say that uh, is is an early research output. So something that is ahead of print, and in most cases, uh, something that is also ahead of uh, peer review. Uh, so any manuscript that is um, produced by researchers um, and that is ready to be shared with the scientific community is a preprint. Uh, in most cases, researchers um, share the uh, a preprint on a preprint server at the same time that they're submitting it to a journal for consideration. And uh, um, in some other cases, it's shared on a preprint server uh, before. It's also possible to share a version of a manuscript after it's already been uh, reviewed and after it's already been uh, published. In that case, a preprint is called a postprint. But in general, uh, the idea of preprinting really involves any type of early sharing uh, and early dissemination of research materials uh, that is done independently of a traditional um, journal submission and journal publication uh, workflow. Um, so preprints have been now uh, been around for over 20 years, I think 25 years or so. Uh, I have a, a, in a couple of slides, I have, I think, some, uh, um, some notions and some, uh, uh, some data around uh, preprint volume and preprint stats. But in general, what I'd like to point out here is that, um, especially among young researchers, there's been a um, there's been a, a trend towards sharing research uh, outputs as early as possible in the uh, research um, uh, production workflow. So here we have a quote, for example, from a uh, from a PhD candidate. Um, uh, who works in, um, in, in biology and neurology. And he's saying, I love preprints. They really allow me to share with the research community a draft version, a, an early version of my manuscript as early as possible in my, in my workflow. Um, so here's some preprinting stats. So preprints, as I said, have been around since I think 1991, I say here, yeah. The archive, I think, was established in 1991. So that's uh, 30 years ago, actually. And um, what's um, what's interesting about um, uh, the archive is that it really started off as a as a place for uh, physicists and computer science computer scientists to share and disseminate their research as early as they had it available. Um, so early on, I believe that the archive was actually run via uh, paper copies. So this is before the, the the internet was actually a thing, before the web was a thing, I should have said. And uh, it then shifted to an email type of distribution list where uh, physicists would uh, uh, disseminate and share the LaTeX sources of their of their files uh, with one another through a mailing list. And then eventually the archive uh, took the shape of an actual uh, of an actual server and became a preprint server. So if you look at how since 1991, the um, uh, archive is, is uh, shaped up, you'll see that uh, it's had a fairly linear uh, increase in volume of preprints that have been, uh, that are posted to the, um, to the server. So we're now at, a, you know, this is a slightly old graph, but Sometimes in 2016, we had, we had about 10,000 uh, submissions a month to the archive. And the blue line that you see here is the submissions to the uh, biology uh, uh, preprint server by archive. As you can see, um, it was about 1,000 submissions per month uh, by the beginning of 2016. So in other words, preprints have been around for a long time for for uh, a very, very long time, for the first 20 years or so, they were really just the sole domain of uh, physics and computer sciences and hard sciences. And in the last uh, few years, as you can see, since pretty much 2015, there's been an increase in the number of uh, preprints also circulated in the, uh, in, uh, the natural sciences and, sorry, in the, um, health sciences and the, in the biological sciences. So then something happened uh, last year in 2020, 
while preprints were already increasing in in biology um, because of the pandemic we started seeing um, uh, an incredibly fast uh, uptake of preprints also in medicine and I should say that medicine until uh, last year was a field in which preprints were uh, not used at all. I believe that the Med, Ar Med Archive was probably, uh, which is the medicine preprint server, was probably only receiving a, a handful of submissions every month. Um, and then compare that to what happened in 2020, when all of the preprints, the cumulative number of preprints uh, submitted to um, all of these different archives by the end of 2020 was about 30,000. Um, so clearly something changed and uh, preprints really started uh, becoming a, um, a vehicle, uh, a way through which uh, researchers were disseminating research as, uh, as fast as possible. And of course, in this case was mission critical information because the research that was being disseminated was research around pandemic and so uh, research that could potentially um, save lives. So the important thing I want to make here to highlight is that in 2020 um, alone, um, for each peer-reviewed publication about uh, COVID-19, there was a preprint. So if you see the graph up here, which is actually from The Economist, you'll see that um, from the beginning of the year, uh, for each individual peer-reviewed article that was published, there was a preprint uh, in a preprint server uh, about COVID-19. So there was a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, peer-reviewed publications and preprints around a specific topic. Uh, now, this is unprecedented. Uh, preprints until 2020 were mostly just um, uh, used within the, the, the physical and computer sciences, and things have definitely changed. And uh, I believe that uh, this change is here to stay, and we'll, we'll see more and more adoption uh, and uptake of preprints um, not just in the in the physical, bi biological, and medical sciences, but across the entire spectrum of disciplines. So uh, I said that preprints were a vehicle to uh, exchange uh, mission critical information as fast as possible, but are they actually too fast? Uh, you probably heard that there's now a number of um, concerns around the fact that preprints in a lot of cases have been picked up by the media and by journalists as actual uh, scientific information. And of course, a lot of preprints, or actually all preprints are not, uh, have not undergone peer reviewed. And so in the case of medical uh, research, um, posting and publishing uh, information um, about uh, with um, with with medical uh, guidelines can have an impact and can of course um, disrupt the way that that we communicate and we perceive science. So there's been a lot of concerns and a lot of like uh, discussions around how to treat uh, preprints, especially when they are um, about a, um, a pandemic and how to treat. Uh, uh, a pandemic, and this is an ongoing conversation that is being. Uh, there's a number of initiatives that are trying to uh, really bring some level of, um, of of rigor and some level of like uh, review and ways for the media and journalists to really perceive um, preprints for what they are: early versions of manuscripts that are shared with the scientific community and the public as soon as possible. I believe I have a quote here from Hilda Bastian, and I agree with her that while um, there's definitely a, a lot of discomfort and there's a lot of um, problems that come with um, from, uh, sort of popular popularizing a uh, concept and the practice such as preprinting, um, they also bring a disruption that is probably and a transformation that is probably needed within the scientific publishing. Uh, industry and in the way that we do communicate and publish science overall. So I think that in the long term, uh, while um, the pandemic has really exacerbated the way that we uh, communicate science, in some cases creating problems, I think that this level of disruption will bring a positive uh, transformation in the long run. 
So just want to do a quick analysis of benefits and challenges before I uh, step into um, some more uh, sort of concrete uh, um, demonstrations and ideas of how um, how we're dealing and and how we're we're doing preprinting. So I already mentioned that for authors, there's clearly the idea of getting uh, a really fast and wide dissemination. Uh, there's no wait time. If you want to post a preprint as an author, you can just post it, and uh, there's no paywall. You get seen, uh, you get you get visibility on your work automatically with almost no wait time, just a few hours in, in or maybe up to a day. Also, um, there's no black box of peer reviews. In other words, instead of um, putting the new early uh, research just in the hands of editors and reviewers, you're now putting early research in, in, in front of everyone, in front of the public. So peer review is no more a, a black box. Um, preprints, of course, uh, at least on most preprint servers, get a, get a DOI, and so they can get cited. And this, in turn, is a really interesting uh, idea. The fact that we are allowing scientists to build the research based on preprints it means that the entire uh, sort of uh, world of science is moving faster, uh, because if that research was not available in the form of preprint, it means that researchers would have to wait until it's published in order to build new research on top of the existing one. Um, preprints also give, through a DOI and a date uh, timestamp, they give researchers record of priority. So in other words, by posting a preprint, you already uh, telling the world that you are, um, that that's your research, and that's when you uh, sent it for review to a journal, and you're stamping it with a DOI and a timestamp that allows you to set your um, um, your record of priority. Um, preprints are not publications, and so they're not usually considered prior publications. I say usually here because there's a couple of journals uh, they still have policies that, that do not fully accept um, preprints. Um, the next point is important. Uh, a lot of funders, such as the NIH, for example, and Wellcome Trust, now accept preprints as part of their uh, grant uh, proposals and applications. This means that having a preprint up is really considered as part of the body of work of a researcher. and. Um, so that's one other benefit and um, one other reason for hosting a preprint. Um, and finally, uh, preprints really enable a new type of evaluation and uh, screening of results that really opens it up to, uh, to the public. So more visibility can lead to uh, more feedback and of course, science will advance uh, faster. There's of course some challenges. Um, the first one is that um, preprints are just unpublished articles, articles that are not um, uh, can pass peer review, and so they're just sort of they become part of a of a preprint server because there's no screening done whatsoever. The second one uh, challenge is the uh, of course the risk of disseminating invalid uh, findings. So as I said, especially uh, with the, um, in the case of uh, COVID and the pandemic, the media in a lot of cases has picked up unvetted uh, in from preprint servers, and in some cases has not flagged it as a preprint, um, and that's that's problematic. The third challenge is that there's still very uh, inconsistent policies in some cases among publishers and lack of, uh, of awareness, even among editors and reviewers and publishers. This, of course, causes confusion on the publisher side and on the author side. I should say that things are now moving towards a, a situation where most publishers, by and large, um, uh, accept and embrace preprints. Uh, the next point is that um, most checks that are done on manuscripts by publishers for plagiarism uh, cannot differentiate between a preprint and a web page or a published article. And so uh, those, uh, those, those checks sometimes uh, return a um, sort of a red flag on preprints. And it's up to the editors to actually know that, you know, a preprint 
server is a preprint server and is not prior publication. Uh, in some cases, editors themselves don't are not actually familiar with the policies of their own uh, of their own journal, uh, which is a problem. And finally, that's probably the least of challenges is that sometimes it's hard for researchers to pick the right preprint server to get the best, the most visibility, and um, uh, for their specific field and for their kind of uh, their kind of work. So, with all that in mind. Um, I should just say what we're doing at Wiley. Uh, at Wiley, we have um, changed our policy over the last few years to truly embrace uh, pre-printing and the early sharing of research. This is a policy that uh, works throughout um, all of Wiley journals, and we try to also promote that level of policy with all the societies that we work with. We're not just doing preprints through policy, however. Um, we're also doing it through technology and through integrations. And the most important one of these is the under review service. So what's the under review service? That's what I wanna uh, talk about for the next few minutes. So under review is a service by which uh, authors can very easily opt in uh, preprinting while they're submitting their, their work to a, uh, to a Wiley journal. So uh, this is what the workflow looks like for a, um, for example, one journal that is part of the uh, the under review uh, service. It's the International Journal of Quantum Chemistry. And um, if uh, an author submits a manuscript to the journal, in the submission system itself, they get a question that asks, would you like to make a preprint out of your manuscript, out of your submission? And they can say yes. If they say yes, with that simple opt-in, um, what we do is that we um, we automatically ingest the content, we convert it to, to HTML, and the moment that the manuscript is assigned to reviewers, um, we post it with a DOI and the document becomes uh, visible and available to be cited and to be shared. So the document gets, gets a DOI and an actual uh, citation. Um, while the document is then undergoing peer review, we have a peer review timeline that is updated at all times automatically and shows at which, which point in the review process the document is. Um, and finally, when the document is, let's just say, accepted and published in the journal, uh, we're able to automatically update the timeline to point and link to the version of record so that each preprint that we have uh, that is already been published, that has been published in a journal, gets linked seamlessly to the uh, to the version of record, so to the publication uh, itself. So that's that's how under review works. And I'd like to just take a few steps now to show you what a typical uh, preprint looks like and what the the workflow looks like a little bit more in detail. So I've told you about the fact that you know um, when an author is submitting a manuscript, they can just automatically preprint in just one click. So that's what we call the opt-in. And it's uh, it's really just a question that is asked uh, to the author in the submission process. Uh, this is what it looks like. It, it has some information about the under review service, but really the bulk of the question is really like, it's a, it's a yes or no question. Would you like to make uh, a preprint out of your, out of your uh, submitted manuscript? And there's no further action asked by the author. So the author doesn't have to go to a separate preprint server, upload a document or uh, insert affiliations and author names. It's everything is automatically done for them. They do um, actually starting next, well, in a couple of weeks or next month, uh, we are opening up the process so that um, when an author uh, wants to preprint a manuscript, they can also say, yes, I wanna make a preprint and please make it on Authoria or please make it on BioArchive. So we're actually not only allowing authors to decide whether they wanna preprint or not, but they also can decide whether they wanna, on what preprint server they uh, they push their their manuscript as a preprint. Um, at the moment, we're mostly uh, linked to the Authoria preprint server, uh, but um, as I said, in the next few weeks, we are uh, now uh, finalizing the integration with two other preprint servers. 
first one is the, the Earth and Space Science Open Archive, uh, which is run by uh, the American Geophysical Union. And the other one is the BioArchive, which is the largest preprint server uh, for biology. As you can see, we have, uh, there's a number of other preprint servers out there. And um, our plan is to try and integrate with as many preprint servers as possible. So to give the authors the ability to, to post a preprint upon submission and make it really easy for them to uh, to decide whether they want to preprint or not, and if they want to preprint, also to decide which target server to push their content to. At the moment, um, uh, under review is running on about I think it's a little bit more than forty at the moment. It's forty two uh, um, journals, uh, journals that sort of differ in domain. Uh, we have health sciences, life sciences, and physical sciences. And as you can see, um, the uh, JOX is part of the of the journals that are participating in in this um, in the under review uh, service. So the under review is already activated and it works already on on JOX. So um, just to show you um, quickly how uh, preprints look like when they're posted on Authoria. So I already mentioned that um, what a what a sort of a how preprints are automatically ingested from the submission system and posted on Authoria. So this is what they look like. They they present a load button at the very top that allows you to download a PDF version of the document. Then they have a title, a list of authors, an abstract. Uh, just as I said, everything gets automatically um, uh, ingested and extracted from the submission. So authors don't have to fill into any additional forms. And then he has a peer review timeline. So in this case, you can see uh, that this specific uh, document was submitted to this journal on this day. And then I'll show you in a second in a live demo how this works. Um, and I'll show you all the details for a specific uh, for a specific manuscript. The one thing I wanted to point out is that if at any point in time, the manuscript is rejected by the journal, this peer review timeline disappears so that the preprint remains in this case on Authoria, but without any uh, peer review uh, information that would disclose um, sort of journal name or publisher name. So the preprint is essentially um, still on a preprint server and it will still retain a DOI, but there will be no information about the, um, the target a journal that it was submitted to. So you can then resubmit as an author, resubmit your work to any other journal. Um, in addition to creating a preprint, we also post the preprint in uh, in a couple of collections. The first one is a collection that um, um, sort of brings together all of the Wiley uh, journals and society journals that we have under the um, uh, the under review service. And the second one is a specific collection that we create for the journal. So you can think of this as a mini preprint server for the journal where you can see what documents have been published in the journal that were also preprinted, and you can also see what documents are currently being reviewed by the journal and are already available as a preprint. Finally, we also post the, the preprint on the on the Authoria preprint server homepage alongside all of the other um, preprints that are either coming in as direct submissions or as um, under review um, submissions. Um, an interesting thing to note is that, um, as I said, the moment we have information about the publication of a of a um, of a of a of, of a manuscript, uh, we then automatically update the peer review timeline to say, "Hey, this is published," and we link to the version of record. Uh, this really allows, and it's it's a great tool for authors to um, let the public know that um, a preprint is actually, uh, there's a there's a, an actual version of record that should be used for uh, citation and it allows a linking between preprints and, um, and published artifacts. Um, in terms of results, as I said, we have now uh, in 2020, by the end of 2020, we had 40 participating journals in the under review service. Uh, this is an, an interesting number, I think, to know. There's there's about 32% opt-in rate. That means that uh, out of um, 
you know, out of uh, uh, the authors that use uh, the submission system to submit their manuscripts, about 32% of them actually opt in to uh, create a preprint. This number, by the way, is in line with some of the other opt-in rates that we've seen in the industry. We've posted over 11,000 preprints in 2020. About 1,500 of them were on COVID-19. So you can see uh, over 10%. That's a that's a, an incredible um, incredible number. So if you remember, in a few few slides ago, I mentioned that there were 30,000 preprints about COVID-19 posted in 2020. 1,500 were posted on the Autoria platform. So we have 1,500 of them out of 30,000. So there's there's an incredible uptake for uh, for COVID-19. Uh, preprints receive, on average, at least that's the number from December, 100,000 uh, monthly views. And so far, all of the preprints uh, posted have received an aggregate of 700 citations uh, already. Um, so clearly there's visibility and there's um, the um, also the possibility to get cited by posting a preprint. The feedback from authors has been really great. Um, we uh, keep track of all the uh, tweets and uh, responses from authors. Uh, in general, what we see is that uh, especially early career researchers are very excited to post their preprint and uh, they talk about it on Twitter and in some cases get tremendous amount of visibility and they really enable their, um, their work to be disseminated uh, widely and uh, we believe that this allows them to really um, just bring more uh, eyeballs and uh, more interest to their to their work by sharing early and sharing widely. Um, there's a couple of other things I want to mention about Autori and then I'll show you uh, before stopping I'll show you a couple of uh, live uh, demonstrations of, uh, of preprints. Um, an important part of the of the Autoria preprint server is that the content itself is not just a PDF. So at Autoria, we pride ourselves as uh, being a uh, a platform that is uh, sort of forward thinking and uh, sort of future driven. So we are really um, excited about changing the way we do research and moving away from a sort of a PDF based uh, type of research publishing. And we think that preprints really offer an experimental test bed to, to try and do new things around uh, research communication. And so um, every time a preprint is automatically posted for you uh, on Autoria through under review, the content itself is available um, and uh, it uh, can be edited by you, by you the author. So if you're an author of the manuscript that has been posted as a preprint, um, if you log in into the system, you can then essentially you have the ability to click edit and by editing the document, you can change some of the uh, the content, the figures, the tables, you can manage collaborators. So you can essentially, essentially change the author list and add more people or remove people. You can share more widely your, um, your preprint. And if you've done any changes, you can also um, republish it so get a new doi version on top of the preprint this really allows some level of um the ability to like uh, to change and we think that we reflect the idea that uh, science is not about publishing um documents that are frozen in time but it's really science is a very iterative type of um process and uh, and as such it should be built on systems that allow content to change uh, over time. So for example, if you are in edit mode, this is an example of what, um, how you can edit a con uh, the content. And uh, when you click edit, you can then insert text, you can insert LaTeX, you can insert figures. And here I show you, for example, that um, uh, I inserted an interactive figure inside the preprint. So preprints in a way, then become also um, a vehicle through which you can um, do some new kind of uh, uh, more interactive and dynamic research that includes also that includes adding data, code, and notebooks. So you can, while publishing in in a traditional journal, you can then use the preprint as the as the place, the vehicle where you 
play with the sharing the data, the code, and these interactive visualizations. And we're now uh, playing with using the preprint to be uh, the vehicle through which the content, this sort of like data and code and interactive content is passed on onto the version of record. So this is an example of a experimental article that we published and the actual published version has this type of like new interactive visualization, which I believe is also interested, uh, would be interesting to um, um, to to JOX and to the um, to your community and to your kind of uh, of research. Um, the last thing I'll mention here, um, and then I'll do a very quick like five minute demo or four minute demo, is that um, an important part of posting your work as um, as preprints is that it also opens it up for uh, public comments, so you can receive. Um, you can receive uh, feedback from the scientific community and the public on your work. And uh, this is more of an experimental workflow that we have ongoing in which we also try and use the preprint as the place in which we publish in an open, transparent manner, also the peer review reports. So the actual reports written by the peer reviewers are associated with the preprints. And the, so the, the preprint really becomes this sort of enhanced version uh, a little bit more raw and a little bit more, you know, sort of malleable, but still in which we try and experiment with new ways of doing um, um, of doing research. So um, I have some resources which I'll share uh, with you uh, afterwards. But uh, before I finish, let me and go to Q and A. Let me just share for a second, um, just a five minute demonstration of what um, Authoria looks like and um, especially what it looks like for uh, for JLX. So um, this is the homepage for Authoria. If you go to authoria.com, you will see that, you know, we now have about uh, over 12,000 uh, preprints um, it, in all kinds of disciplines. And uh, the idea is that we, we share and post research, open research, as soon as it is available. So it's really a platform for uh, the sharing of early stage uh, research. These are some of the most recently posted preprints. So as you can see, all of them posted today, February 9th. Um, and uh, if you keep scrolling, you can then see that we have a section for the recently published uh, preprints. So preprints that were recently published in scholarly journals. So all of these preprints were initially made um, available as preprints, as you can see in November. Uh, and um, then, were connected and linked to the version of record because they were actually published uh, in a journal. And it doesn't have to be a Wiley journal. They can be published in any journal from any publisher whatsoever. And we link them up to the version of record. So the idea, the, the how Authoria works is that you upload or create your research work, uh, or in, in the case of under review, you don't even have to upload or create, it's automatically done for you and you just disseminate your research uh, through a DOI. And um, you can, of course, get uh, submit um, to journals, get published. And uh, we're, as I said, we're experimenting with uh, innovative ways to do um, um, peer review. So um, there's a couple of collections I wanna show you that are important. The first one is the Wiley Open Research Collection, uh, which, as I said, groups together, brings together all of the content and all of the journals that are part of the uh, of the under review uh, service. So as you can see, if you click here, you can see that this is the list of all the journals that are part of this collection. And, um, and you can see that there's currently 2000 uh, documents that are being reviewed by these journals in aggregate. And um, all of them have been uh, all of these 2016 have opted in to uh, create a preprint. So they're part of this. Uh, you can actually see what sort of uh, documents are currently in the pipeline at Wiley and are currently being uh, reviewed. And if you click on public documents, this sh shows the 2,761 um, documents that were initially made available as a, um, as a preprint and then were published in a in a, in a journal. So now if you click on one of the 
journals in this list. And if I pick JOX, for example, you land on a page like this. This is a, as I said, it's a mini preprint server uh, for the journal. And you can see, for example, that there's four documents at the moment that are being uh, reviewed by JOX that were made available as a preprint. Whereas there's 16 that were initially made available as a preprint and then published in the uh, scholarly record. So they were published in the journal. So now navigating some of these um, uh, some of these documents, I'm gonna open this one for example, and I have it open right here. This is what a um, a preprint uh, looks like. As you can see at the top, you can download a PDF version of the document. And actually, just to show it to you, I'm gonna open it. So this is what it looks like. As you can see, it's got a watermark on the left that says that uh, it's very small, but it says this is a preprint. Uh, and then you can sort of browse the full uh, PDF. But on the homepage, we also have an abstract, this peer review information, which I'm going to talk about in a second, but all of the full text is available in HTML format. So it's HTML first with all of the figures and all of the tables. Um, the most important part of the preprint is, of course, the citation box that gives a DOI uh, to the document together with a, a, a license. So this allows the authors, in this case, to be cited for their work. There's also a disclaimer that I talked about. It says, this is a preprint, it has not been peer reviewed, data may be preliminary. I should note that in the case of medical journals, we have a specific disclaimer that is even a little bit stronger. It says, information from this preprint should not be used as medical uh, guidelines. Um, and finally, a, the peer review timeline shows that this document is under review. It's, it was submitted to JOX on September 14th. Then I can actually show all of the details of the peer review timeline. So you can see there's a very rich interaction between uh, the editor, the authors, and the reviewers, which is all um, sort of explained and uh, um, presented in a very distilled and granular way in this uh, timeline. So as you can see, this document, for example, has gone through uh, two revisions uh, already. And uh, we believe that having this information on the preprint will actually help um, in making preprints much more reliable. And this is one important reason why we think that uh, preprinting is done better if publishers uh, get involved. Um, if a journalist had to uh, bump across or come across um, this preprint, for example, they would be able to refer to this preprint as currently under review at JOX. And that allows, in a way, to bring, uh, to inject the preprint with a level of um, a screening and rigor that is provided by publishers. So I believe that this is a very, um, a very important move for for Authoria, but for preprint servers in general to try and connect whenever possible to the peer review timeline and to the and then to the version of record. And on that point, I'll show you the the last um, preprint I wanted to show you. This is a one that is in the published. Um, uh, it's been already published in the. It's this one over here. It's been published in JLX, and as you can see, uh, it looks like the other one. He has a title. Uh, he has a peer review timeline, a citation box, and here's the uh, the document. In this case, it's, I think it's a commenter, commentary, so it doesn't have a, a an abstract. But the important part that I want to show you here is that it's um this is the timeline, and as you can see, the last event that we have is the publication in JOX with the link to the version of record. Now, I if I go to the version of record, this points straight to the um, to the actual publication, to the version of record which is published. So it really allows for um, a seamless transition from the preprint version to the to the published uh, version. So with that, I'm going to bring back my uh, Q and A uh, slide, and I will stop there. And uh, if there's any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them right now. Great. Hey, thanks, thanks, Oliver. Well, that was pretty interesting. Um, we have a couple questions. I have a question I'd like to ask first. Um, 
you mentioned that preprints can be uh, updated and then reassign a new DOI. So is that so? Presumably, a preprint could have five DOIs associated with it. Is that correct? Or am I misunderstanding that? Yeah. No. I mean, you're not uh, you're not misunderstanding it. So what happens is that in in the world of uh, DOIs, uh, it, the versioning of DOIs actually is is something that is is a it's a convention on how DOIs are actually structured. So if you get a, um, a specific DOI for a preprint and then you get a new version, what we do is we actually mint a new DOI that has a slash V2 to it, which essentially like creates a new a new version for the first DOI, but it's essentially a new a new DOI. So yes, um, okay. in practice, this is something that we are discussing with a um, with a preprint um, sort of task force in which we're trying to determine how the how citations and how um, DOIs will look like into the future. Um, but I do think that versioning is fundamental and as it very much reflects this sort of notion of like science being more uh, something that, you know, change at all times. And we need to like somehow try and capture that change through through versions of DOIs. Right, okay. and then. Preprints can also be updated, which is part of this, but after a, a paper is accepted, for example, does that preprint mm -hmm. still allow for, for revisions or changes, or is, once it's accepted, is that it? So after it's accepted, in principle, it can still change. Uh, and the, the changes aren't published into the preprint until the author um, pushes the you know the changes and mints a new DOI so gets a new DOI version for for the document so we are it's it's a very important point that you make and it's also something that we are discussing not just internally within under review but something that we're discussing with the broader preprint um, task force and initiative um, we do believe that there's value in allowing preprints to be updated and most preprint servers are allowing that and we don't have a sort of like a we don't have a, a time barrier in that when a document is accepted and published um we stop allowing the authors to make edits we essentially any author can make any edits to their preprints at any time and that seems to be the direction that some other preprint servers are enabling other preprint servers mostly allow the uh, update of a pdf document whereas we allow the full editing of the document I, I don't know which direction we will go um, we will go in, but I believe that um, that perhaps it's not necessarily that you know uh, we will stop authors from from making edits, uh, but it's possible that we will probably have to encapsulate and create a linkages between preprints that have changed dramatically from the published version, and maybe there's maybe there's some value and there's a, there's reason for uh, for, for doing that, you know, maybe there's a there's an interesting way in which right. science will evolve is that it will allow this like constant change and reiteration and re um, uh, rehashing of the science. Uh, so right. it's 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 an experiment. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. I do have a question here from from one of the viewers. Um, what is the effect of on the paper if eventually the paper is rejected you kind of talked about that a little bit in your slides yeah. but that's that's the most asked question we get so maybe i'll just re i'll answer it again yeah, yeah. um so preprints are independent from a uh, journal publishing um so for example in the field of physics uh and so the archive for example it's always been a very um, uh, a process and a workflow separated from the from journals, um, and because of that, uh, we try to have also a very publisher agnostic workflow. And so, if you submit a paper to JOX, for example, you opt in to make a preprint. Um, if the paper is rejected from JOX, you still have a preprint available because the preprint was already stamped with a DOI. You probably already received citations 
and you can then submit to any other journal you want, but the preprint itself will remain, um, it's part of the scholarly record, it's part of the preprint ecosystem, you can get citations, and uh, that should not affect your ability to resubmit it and publish it elsewhere. Okay, okay good. Um, I do have one other thing. Could, mm -hmm. Maybe with preprints, it's all kind of new to, to some of us, and do you have like uh, maybe perhaps the best tips for success of preprinting something? I mean, I saw earlier in one of your slides, there's a you had a tweet up there about um, some of this stuff is absolutely junk science, right? And, mm -hmm. and can't pass peer review. And yeah, maybe some of that happens, but is there a mm -hmm. best practices or tips to preprint a manuscript? Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know if that's something that, that you really can answer or not, but yeah um i think probably you gave me a good idea that i probably should add a slide in my in my deck that actually has like you know this is the best practices and tips for optimal and uh, effective preprinting that's a good idea w what i will say is yeah. that while yeah. i did have while i did have that tweet up uh, talking about the junk science um peer review is a great way and a great process to screen um, research, but it's not, you know, the holy grail. And of course, there's a lot of like science scientific papers that get rejected. And so, you know, this is a, you know, the normal process of, you know, science making, which we're constantly approximating and finding new ways and better ways to, you know, to um, um, better results to the to the problems that we have. And so, what I will say yeah. is that I would not be scared of the um, of the perception that preprints, you know, include junk science. There's there's junk science in, uh, in you know, in also in the published literature. So instead, yeah, sure. I will, I would focus on the fact that preprinting is a, is a way to give researchers, and as I said before, especially early career researchers, a way to create a platform, to to become more visible for their for their work and research to get cited and also to be able to um, apply for grants uh, since now most funding agencies actually do allow preprints to be included in the body of work of a scholar. Um, so in general, I would say um, getting in touch with your own community and seeing what kind of trends exist in the community, in the scholarly community and seeing what practices, you know, what are scholars doing? What are the, you know, uh, successful people doing in terms of preprinting and trying to follow like the you know that their lead I think is the best way to probably do preprinting in a in a sort of safe and accepted way accepted by the you know community of practice of course. Mm -hmm. I, I did just get one more question here and mm -hmm. uh, maybe we'll wrap up after that but it, mm -hmm. and it's kind of related to the rejection of a paper again if, if a paper or preprint is defined by journal A and then it's submitted to journal B and the author chose chooses to upload that submission as well. How is that handled in terms of DOI versions? And it's just these days papers can get rejected at any time before it gets to a journal finally. But yeah. Yeah. So the one thing I will say there is that from a preprinting perspective, um, as I said, most publishers do allow uh, their authors to preprint. So um, if journal A rejects um, rejects a, a, a document that has already been preprinted, for example, what we normally recommend is that when resubmitting to another journal, uh, to journal B, uh, not to preprint again because you already have a preprint and it's up and it already has a DOI. In fact, what we do is we advise the authors to even cite the preprint itself upon submission so that they make it as extremely clear and transparent that they have a preprint um, up. Um, the last thing I'll say is that while preprints have been you know, perceived by some researchers, especially in the new field and disciplines as, you know, uh, oh, am I gonna get scooped because I'm you know, putting my research out there? So I'll say that in, in the world right. of physics, astronomy and computer science, preprints have been widely adopted for the last 30 years. And uh, you know the, the the field is uh, is healthy and uh, up and running, and um, the I, I believe that preprinting 
if anything, prevents the you know stealing and the plagiarism and your research to be scooped because you're actually time stamping it and telling the world that you have your work out there. Um, and uh, so it's a great way to set your record of priority. Right, no, that's a good point. And I did get one more question, sorry, Alberto. Um, <laughs> no so worries. If you preprint something, you pre pre -print something but it's never published and the preprints online, um, they're asking if it will count as a publication for the author. And, and I mean, so it will not. Yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah, I will say it, it will not count as a publication. But as I said before, um, preprints can be listed in well, can be cited, so they will get citations, um, and they can be listed in you know in as I said in the scholarly body of work that is submitted for grant applications. Um, I personally have, for example, I, as I said, I posted my first preprint in. 2006, and I do have a couple of preprints that are unpublished. They're just sitting on a preprint server. They get cited. They they get um, they are used uh, while not being published, and that's okay. There's the last thing I'll say is that we tend to think as research as just being composed of one output, one type of format, which is the research paper there's many kinds of research outputs that really compose research data code white papers student student essays blog posts and uh, preprints allow preprint servers allow um, and offer a type of a place a location where this sort of alternative non-traditional research public uh, research outputs can be in a way posted and published even if they don't go traditional peer review um, and the very last thing I'll say, and I know that we're almost out of time, is that also publishers are very interested in experimenting with new forms of peer review that um, actually do involve uh, preprints. So I think that preprints will be used more and more in the future as um, as a, you know experimental ways to uh, to run screening and peer review in a more innovative and experimental way. So there's there's some I think that there's it's an exciting it's an exciting field uh, to be working in. So so are preprints uh, indexed by Scopus or anything like that, or does that change your citation index for an author? Um, they are indexed by Google Scholar. All of the preprints on Autoria are indexed by Google Scholar, so they will um, they will increase your sort of say age index on Google Scholar. I'm not familiar. I I actually have to like. Uh, they're of course indexed, and the DOIs come from Crossref. Um, I would have to check on Scopus, but I believe Scopus only takes into account peer-reviewed publication citations to peer-reviewed publications research. So in that case, no, it will not increase your sort of official Scopus um, impact as an as a researcher. Right, right. So obviously, like someone publishing stuff with that's patentable or has proprietary rights to it, it needs to be careful with preprinting, obviously. For yeah. Patent purposes yeah. and whatnot. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Good. All right. I, I, with that, I'll. I'll. It's probably a good place to wrap up, and I, I very much thank you for taking your time and and uh, kind of informing us about preprints. It's uh, always good to learn more about about mm -hmm. this this kind of new path we're taking. So it's great. Thanks, Alberto. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one. Yeah. Bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you for attending the webinar.